Okay, so how many periods are there in the periodic table? Eight. Eight? Ooh. One off. Seven. Seven. You got eight colors last time because there were eight, uh, the eight families that you had. Uh, but there are seven periods on the periodic table, and they're listed up there on the side. Um, the main thing there is that y'all would call them rows, but in chemistry, we call them periods. If you see rows on the test, that is incorrect. FYI, just to let you know. We may say they go horizontally in rows, but uh, you do need to know that they are periods. Um, but anyway, uh, why do you need to know about the periods? They represent one thing on the periodic table with each element, which is what? You have seven periods and also how many? And say what? Energy levels, yes. So they go from top to bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven periods, seven energy levels. If that element is in that period, then it is in that energy level. So if I say zinc, which is in, kind of in the middle, off to the right a little bit, that is in what energy level if it's in period four? Uh, fourth, energy fourth energy level. So, uh, or y'all would say in that little green area on the board there. So in reality, the area, in the case you missed this, the periodic table is actually kind of stretched out. But we don't, it's really kind of hard to carry that around. Um, so that's what they've done is squeeze it in there so it could actually fit a little bit better on an 8 by 11 sheet of paper. That's really the only reason why they did it. So we talked about this last time, valence electrons. Let me uh, retard, as I would say, about these guys. You already took this down, uh, but in case you missed it. Uh, valence electrons are electrons in the outer energy level. We only care about the outer ones because those are the ones that bond and react and do things. The inner energy levels that are already filled, we don't care because they, they're full. They're not going to do anything. They're satisfied. But the outer part is not. So atoms are arranged on the periodic table so that, they, uh, so that the ones with similar properties all line up in families or groups. And so basically what we're going to look at now is the vertical columns. Uh, the number of energy, uh, I'm sorry, the number of valence electrons play a big role in how the atom behaves. So in other words, if they have the same number of valence electrons, they're going to act the same. And it's, it's true and true all the way through. So, so off to the left here, we have the alkali metals. Now do realize that I have put up here, exclude hydrogen. Hydrogen does not have a family. He's kind of adopted, but we put him in with this. He's not a metal is what I'm trying to say but he falls into this family because he has one valence electron. Uh, coming over here, you got the alkali earth metals. First family over here is the boron family, which is in yellow. The green that you see over here is the carbon family. The little uh, light blue that you see here is the nitrogen family. Next one over is the oxygen family, and after that is the halogens. Now, why are these guys up here called uh, boron, carbon, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen family? That's the first element. So here's the thing. These four should not be hard to identify. The other four, you actually really got to know the names because the four middle ones right here, they have the names as the first element that's up there. So that should be pretty easy. Halogens and noble gases. So the two on the end and the two on the right, those are the ones usually you got to actually uh, kind of remember their names. The reason why these are called halogens is because iodine is actually one of them and used to, when they put it on like a, a starch or a sheet of paper, it would make a halo ring. And that's why they started calling them halogens. Uh, noble gases are actually, they always put this on some kind of science portion, ACT or some MCAT thing, just to see if you know your chemistry class very well. Noble gases are very important because they are the ones that are completely satisfied. They're the only elements in their neutral form that are satisfied. And we're going to talk about that. And that's the reason why they're noble is because they don't share electrons. They, they're nobles. And we'll go back over the nobles here in a little bit. Now, we are going to name these guys down here. We just don't color these guys in because of the valence electrons. All right, so before we move on to listing out the rest of the families, if you'll take a look at the top of each one that is colored, you might want to do this. And you can do this on your personal periodic table as well, your little green one that I gave you, OK? So do me a favor. Yeah, go ahead and get out that green periodic table. I'm going to show you a trick. So the reason why these are in groups is because of valence electrons. And valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell. OK? So notice this. Look at the very top of your periodic table. You'll notice that there's like a 1A, 2A, and then the Bs, and then it goes back to As again. You see all that? Guess what? That tells you the number of valence electrons. 
surprise. Now, not the whole numbers that you see up there, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, all the way up to 18. Yeah, don't worry about those. You need to look at the ones that have the A's and the B's, because those are going to actually help you out. The number in front tells you how many valence electrons. So group 1 right here, or group 1A, has how many valence electrons? One. One. Group 2A? Two. Two. Go all the way over here. Group 3A? 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. All these guys have that set number of valence electrons. The maximum you can have is eight, okay? Well, for neutral standpoint, that is. Until you get to these guys down here, that's one reason why we did not highlight them. Notice that they have Bs, that they're not As. Do you notice that? There's a reason why they're Bs. These guys' valence electrons can vary, okay? They're like honey badgers. They can do what they want. Um, they don't have to have a full eight. They like to try to get that, but they can actually extend their uh, satisfaction of octet rule. And we're actually going to get to the octet rule here in a second. But anyway, these guys are the transition metals that are in the creamy filling right here. Also, these guys are in the creamy filling too, because remember, they fit right here. This right here is the lanthanide and the actinide series. Um, and they're actually written on your periodic table off to the side. So you never really have to kind of memorize those. Really, you just know the transition metals. The reason why they're called transition metals is because they can transition their octet. So what you need to do also on that uh, colored periodic table, you can do this also if you want, but you may want to write the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 as you go across. I'm going to show you a quick picture of what I mean, so hold on one second. All right, so be sure you have these guys labeled. We are going to go more into these guys later, but you need to go ahead and have them labeled now. Next unit, it's all about knowing what these families do and how they behave. So first off, alkali metals, and they're kind of in order as you go across. Alkali metals is that first group. Alkaline earth metals is the second. No, they are not the same family. Alkali, alkaline. By the way, how I always remembered alkaline earth metals is that, uh, well, they come from the earth. They're very commonly found in the earth, like calcium and magnesium. Um, transition metals are in the creamy filling. That's usually the colored in part. Okay, so anyway, lanthanide and actinide series, those are the two bottom rows. Uh, how you can remember? Well, they begin one with lanthanide and the other one with actinide. Yeah, don't really know if I should go into that. Boron, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen families, they all begin with the first element that is in that family. Halogens are the chlorine, the iodine, yada, 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 and fluorine. Very interesting fluorine. And noble gases are the very end. Uh, we like to exclude the noble gases in a lot of things because, well, they're just not reactive. They have their full shell. They're not going to want to bond with anything. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. On that same chart where you just colored in the columns, I would also put the number of valence electrons above their heads. Now, keep this in mind because on your test that you're going to get, uh, you'll get an extra periodic table that's just like the one, your green one. However, remember, it won't have all the notes that you're writing down on it. So if you remember the 1A, the 2A, and things like that, that's the same number of valence electrons. It's good to practice with. So why should you care about the number of valence electrons? Well, they're all going to react the same way. I'll give you a quick little uh, rundown here. For example, the very first group, uh, alkaline, uh, I'm sorry, alkali metals. In their pure form, they explode when you put them in water, all of them. So they'll start off with a smaller explosion, but as you keep going all the way up to the more radioactive ones in energy level seven, they get even bigger. So uh, now again, here's another good question. If they have a B, they do have a beginning number of valence electrons, but they can vary. So if you look at the middle group in the transition, they'll have like, uh, I don't know, 3B, 4B, 7B, and then it'll shift to something else. They have that set number to begin with, but they can also vary. Uh, that's one reason why they they're kind of interesting with metals because they all do something a little bit different than the normal trend. All right. So if you got your notes printed out, you might see this over here. This is just another little backup. So group 1A, it's really easy to remember, look at this and actually tell at the top of your head. Uh, write down the number of valence electrons. By the way, for 3 through 12, which is the Bs, just write the word very. V-A-R-Y. Okay, so group 1A is going to have one valence electron. Group 2A is going to have two. The Bs are going to vary. Group 3A is going to be uh, three. 
valence electrons, group 4A is going to be 4, group 5A is going to be 5, group 6A is going to be 6, group 7A is going to be 7, group 8A is going to be 8 except for helium. Why does helium, sat why is helium only satisfied with 2? Okay, so it's part of that first little energy level. Let's go back and I'll show you. There we go. Okay, remember this? They're in energy level one, so they can only max the number of electrons they can have is two. And that's the reason why he doesn't fit the whole rest of the other guys. He, however, is probably one of the most stable. It's really hard to steal his electrons, and we'll talk about that. One reason why they're really close to the nucleus. Okay. <laughs> Got to fast forward, you know. Um, okay. So use the number of valence electrons as dots and space them around the four sides of the element symbol and then pair them up as needed. This is a quick crash course. We're not really going to go too much into Lewis structures because that's more AP stuff anyway. But if you take a close look at both of these, you don't have to write this down, but um, it wouldn't hurt to get the first sample out of each group. In other words, up here at the very top, it wouldn't hurt to actually put them at the very top. Like, go ahead and write uh, kind of those on the side. Uh, you don't have to do each one because they're all going to repeat as you go down, but I would at least get the first one out of each group. So, for example, you got hydrogen. It has one, one valence electron. Beryllium has two. Boron has three. Carbon has four. Nitrogen has five. Oxygen has six, seven, eight. However, some people are like, okay, well, is there a certain order you need to go in with your dots? Yes and no. There is a very precise way of doing it. But honestly, uh, here's my rule. Put one on each side before you start doubling up. That's really all it really means. So hydrogen's going to have one valence electron. How many does beryllium have? Two. Two. You could put it here, here. You could put one on top and the other one on bottom. That's perfectly fine. We call these just a place where they can potential bond sites are. In other words, where you see uh, and just one dot by itself on one side, that's where it's like a trailer hookup. They can actually bond there. They have an open hand ready to bond, in other words, is what I'm saying. So how many bonds can hydrogen have then? One. Just one. It cannot have, there's nothing else here. So it can only bond one time. He can only have a single bond. How many can beryllium have then? Two. Two. Keep going down the line and you'll see. So boron three. can have three. And that's, there's actually a whole set of individual chemistry based around this one element. It's really crazy. Uh, carbon. Four. Four. This is one reason why carbon is in everything. How many bond sites can it have? One, two, three, four. It bonds to everything. It can have a single bond, double bond, triple bond. It can do all these kind of things. You wouldn't be put together right now without carbon. All right, moving on to where we start doubling up. Nitrogen. Five. So what I like to do, I always go clockwise. So one, two, three, four, five. How many bond sites? Five. Well, how many ele valence electrons is five, but how many potential bonds can it have? Three. Only three, because there's only an empty spot here, here, oh, and here. So only three. He can't bond up here, because that's a lone pair, and they are already paired up. So by the way, how many, uh, how many electrons are in a bond? That is actually a old biology question. Two. Only two. So in other words, I got one space here, so it takes another, another element with another electron can come up and hook up with another. That's what it means by bond. It takes two to tango. So this one has actually three bonding sites. Uh, move on. Who's the next guy? Oxygen. He has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two. How many? Two. Very good, you're on the ball there. Uh, by the way, this also makes sense because when you take oxygen and you bond it with hydrogen, you get water. So one reason why they call it the Mickey, yeah, one reason why they call it the Mickey Mouse molecule, let me try this in two different colors, okay? Neat, 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 neat. <laughs> okay, now let me try this with the brown to represent hydrogen. So I take this hydrogen, I can hook him up right here. All right, and he's also, however, he's got another spot, right? I can take another hydrogen and plug it in right here. That's how water is made. 
they're sharing electrons right here. This hydrogen, the brown represents the um, hydrogen's electron, and the blue represents the oxygen's. So they're sharing electrons right there. That's what I mean by hookup. You've got to have one with the other to actually potentially hook up. Um, notice this, though. How many electrons does this guy have now? He has eight. Now, if I start overlapping with hydrogen, how many does he have? Can he only have up to two? He's in the first energy level, right? So they're both satisfied. That's how elements work with each other. They're trying to get that full eight shell. And we're going to talk about what that eight shell is. Uh, that is just a quick example. But anyway, back to the other ones. Oxygen, uh, after oxygen comes what? Fluorine. Fluorine. How many does it have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many spots does he have? One. Just one. So like him, he can only bond with one other element. He can bond with himself and have another fluorine right here, or he can have hydrogen come in and plug in right there. And so all this is is nothing but puzzle pieces actually just plugging in where everything can go. Now what's really crazy though is that sometimes you can actually have elements double bond to the same element. That's a stronger bond. That's like an element holding on with two hands instead of just one. So anyway, last but not least is, let's not do helium. We already kind of see helium up there because he only has two. Uh, let's do neon. How many does he have? Eight. A full eight. Can he bond then? No. no. So that's why they're called the noble gases. Um, they don't bond with anybody. So what? Uh, yeah. They t they're doing that to represent the full shell uh, because the first levels uh, can only have two electrons. So the, the, if they put it on the other side, that would look like uh, beryllium, and then it looked like he could bond twice. But helium does not bond. He don't like anybody. Okay, so as we look into some of these guys, keep this in mind. Ions are atoms that gain or lost electrons. You already took down this note, by the way. And keep in mind what a cation and an anion. No, not cations and anions, but cation, which is positive, anion, which is negative. So the reason why you kind of got to know how many valence electrons they have is that if you remove some of those electrons, they start forming those charges. So you heard me talk about the octet rule here uh, a second ago. This is what I'm talking about. Their mission, all atoms do this. They will gain or lose or even share electrons so that they have that full valence shell. Except for the first energy level, they follow the duet rule, which is only just hydrogen and helium. Everybody else, though, is going to go for that full eight. So here's the thing. Depending on if you gained or lost electrons, you're going to form a charge. And that's where we end up getting those little ions that we were talking about. However, which is the only group that is not going to uh, give up electrons or do anything else? There's only one group that does not want to bond, the noble gases. They're going to have a charge of zero. That's why they don't bond. Now, this is going to play a huge role, huge role in Unit 4. So this is one of the bigger notes. Actually, this is probably the second most important thing other than the law of conservation of mass. Because if you know what the elements want to do, you can then predict what they're going to do. I mean, this is their mission. They're going to give up electrons, drop down a level, or steal more electrons and jump up, or they're just going to say, hey, let's have a mutual agreement and just form a bond. So just like we showed you a second ago with water, they are sharing electrons. They said, OK, well, I, got, I have two spots open. You two uh, hydrogens have, two, uh, have just one spot open for each of y'all's. Let's make an agreement. Y'all bomb on my two sides. Uh, but anyway, they're making a potential, you know, sharing. However, some elements will steal electrons. They say gain or lose. Eh, it ain't gain or losing. It's stealing. Let's just get right down to it. Let's get the, out the hippie stuff and get right into the other kind of thing. So, for example here, when this will usually happen with the gain and lose is between a metal and a non-metal. In other words, if they're on the opposite sides of the periodic table, they're going to steal. Let me give you a quick sample here. All right, so here's an example. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, okay? So if it has five valence electrons, how many more does it need to be satisfied? Three. Three. So is it easier for it to lose five or gain three? Gain three. 
it's easier for it to gain three. Okay, does that make sense? Because if he lost all five, yes, he'll drop down a level, but that doesn't make much sense. That's you paying out more than what you're getting. Okay, and that, that, that just doesn't make sense. You're going to be one of the ones that take it in. So if uh, she, let's say she, gains three electrons, electrons are negative, right? So what is her charge going to be? Negative three. Okay, does that make sense? That's where now we're getting from valence electrons into charges. And I'm about to, on that third periodic table on your little sheet, we're going to start writing charges above their heads. In fact, I would do it on your colored periodic table here in a second, like your green one, I mean. Um, sodium has one valence electron, so it's easier for it to lose one or gain seven. Lose one. It's easier for it to lose one and drop down. So that's why he's going to end up having a positive charge. By knowing this, guess what? The charges correlate with how many valence electrons they have. So not only can you predict how many valence electrons now, you can also predict their charge. And that is the most important thing actually for the next, for the rest of the semester. Um, okay, so for example, we talked about water. All right, well, let's talk about the other compound that other people know about. You know what salt is, right? NaCl. Well, how does that look bonded? Well, let's take a sodium, which is in the alkali family. It'd look like a these. One valence electron. And how many does chlorine have? Seven. Seven. Here we go. Hold on, hold on. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So when they do get together, it turns out that sodium is not just bonding right there. They're not sharing. Uh, that chlorine stole that electron from sodium. And what he's going to do is drop down to his previous energy level. All right, so let me jump back for a second. Whoa, that's actually where I was wanting to go. Why did I jump too far? All right, so if you'll take a close look at the bottom, let me zoom in. So look at sodium. Do you see him? He's right here. How many valence electrons does he have again? One. Just one. So when he actually gave up this electron, chlorine is getting the full shell here. Now, if chlorine gains an electron, what's her charge now? Negative one. Negative one. She just gained one. So she's a negative one charge. Sodium lost an electron, and so he gave up that electron to over here, but however, if he gave up one, now what is his charge? Positive one. Positive one. Do opposites attract? Yes. So what's going on here, and I'm going to come back to this more later because it's going to be more important, but if you'll take a look at these two guys, what he w did was like, here, I'll just, here, I'm a nice guy, I'm going to give up an electron because you need you know, the electron to fill your side, and I'll just drop down to my lower energy level, because if you notice this, if you take off that electron, does he now have a full eight? He's satisfied. However, he now has a plus one charge. And he's like, okay, wait a minute, I changed my mind, give me back my electron. Give it, give it, give it, give it, give it, give it, give it. And so chlorine's like, no, get away from me, you creep. Um, and that's actually what's going on, is that she's now negative, he's now positive. He wants it back, but he's basically following chlorine around. And we'll talk about those bonds way later, but that's unit four. Okay, so let me go back to where I was. So they'll gain and lose electrons to get what they need. Uh, nitrogen's going to be easier for him to give up, uh, or I'm sorry, to take in three. But he's going to get those electrons from someone else. They don't, the electrons aren't just flying around. Um, that's what encourages the bonding process. So there's our sodium that we're looking at again. If it's a sodium atom, it has a full 11. However, it's got that one extra electron. It's like, he's, ah, I don't want this. I want to have my full eight. Can someone please take this electron? And that's when chlorine comes in and says, sure. And it's like, now I'm positive. But however, I'd like it back. Come back, come back, come back. You know, chase them down, that kind of thing. OK. So what you need to write above your other periodic table, the third one, if we're not coloring this one in. But if you want to draw some of these samples on there, that's perfectly fine, too. It wouldn't hurt. Um, but on your green one and on this one, I would write these charges above their heads. You do not know how much that helped me out in college, knowing those charges above the head. They're going to play a huge role later, huge. So definitely put them on top of your green one. Because one reason why I say that, if you're studying and working with your green one, that one's going to look exactly like the one on your test. So when you look at your test, you're going to be like, oh, well, 
I got you know photographic memory, so it actually remembered plus one, plus two, plus three. Uh, by the way, this one right here is plus or minus four. It's going to be four, but it can be plus or minus. Then you got the negative three, negative two, negative one, and the last group again they're neutral. They're noble gases. They're noble gases. Those guys are zero. They do not bond. So when we do get to the bonding unit, you can take that last column and throw it out because, well, I mean, don't scratch them out, but uh, just know why they don't bond. However, these guys in the middle down here, notice we kind of skip over that. They don't follow this trend. They're going to be positive because they're going to have that, but their number is going to change depending on what other column they're in. Uh, same thing we were just talking about the charges. Group 1A makes a plus 1. Group 2A makes a plus 2. The Bs, if their valence electrons vary, guess what? So do the charges. Their charge is going to vary. It will be positive, but we just don't know the number because they, they will, depending on what element it is, it can do whatever it wants. Like, for example, iron can have like four different plus charges. Uh, 3A is going to be uh, plus 3. Uh, 4 is going to be plus or minus 4. Because guess what? If they're plus or minus four, they can either gain four or lose four. That's what's really crazy. And there's, as you can see, that's right on this little split of that line. So, but anyway, um, 5A is going to be negative three. 6A is going to be negative two, seven, yada, yada, yada. And the very last group is not going to do anything because they are full shell. Just one. All right. So. Right at the bat, number one says, how many electrons are in the outermost energy level, which means the valence electrons. Valence. Yes, that's an A. Um, there we go. Well, so we're talking about the valence electrons here uh, of an electrically neutral atom of aluminum. Okay? So how many does it have? Valence electrons, which is the outermost. Well, let's take a look. First off, find aluminum, as the British say, which is right here. Okay, he's in group 3A. So, how many valence electrons does he have? Three. So, it's all because of the group that it's in. And people do get them confused with these guys in here because these are transition, because aluminum we use a lot, but don't get them confused with over here. He's one of those that does have a set number. Uh, number two. The blank have two electrons in their outermost shell. In other words, another valence. Who has two valence electrons in their entire family? Well, let's find. Group 2A, which is which family? Alkaline Earth. Alkaline Earth. That's good that I have a periodic table up here. Uh, number three says vertical rows, which are the vertical means go up and down. Horizontal is side to side. Yes, I know. I put that word in there to mess with you. Uh, <laughs> I should say vertical columns because that really should say columns. So let's change that to columns just to be. That's more politically correct. Let's go with that because that really shouldn't say vertical rows because that's kind of an oxymoron. Um, no, not an oxymoron. Oxymoron. Okay. I'm. Probably, anyway, moving on. Vertical columns of the periodic table are known as, if they go up and down, they're groups. If they had families on there too, that'd be another good one. All right, now this one's very interesting. I like it, this one. It's hard to kind of see, but that is 88 right up there. So how many electrons does a um, isotope of strontium with a plus two charge have? All right, now they're wanting to know the total. Did they, they did not say valence electrons. They said electrons which is all of them put together. Some people think this number has something to do with it. That is incorrect. The number up here, remember, that's the mass number. That's only when you're dealing with isotopes. Did they say anything about mass number or isotopes in this question? Nope, that's to throw you off, and they will mess with you. Uh, if they could do this, some programs don't let them do this, but strontium, find strontium, what element is that? All right, right over, oh wait, you can't see it. Let me, beep. All right, so strontium's right here, okay? So its atomic number is really 38. So sometimes you'll see like 38 up here. That's how they'll form it. Y'all did something like this on that homework from last week, okay? 
That one was crazy. But remember, that's the atomic number, that's the mass number. They want no electrons. These two numbers have nothing. No, well, the top one to the left has absolutely nothing to do with this. The 38, though, could help you out because that's the atomic number. They didn't really have that one on there, but that's uh, because the process, the software wouldn't let me. Uh, but anyway, so strontium has uh, element 38, right? So normally, it has 38 protons, therefore how many electrons? 38. However, it has a plus two charge. So remember the little formula. We said protons uh, plus the uh, electrons. Let me do it this way. Put in parentheses. We'll give you the charge. Okay? So we know the charge is plus two. So basically we need to know what minus 38 will give us plus two. In other words, 38 minus what will give us plus two? 36. So guess what the answer is? 36. Remember that little formula. It'll help you out. If you want to rearrange it to this kind of thing where you just subtract the protons and the electrons, that can help too. But I like to plug it in in the normal formula. I will tell you, this is a good one. 